I can hear you, Morgan. You can hear you. Uh, I can. Okay. So, um, there are. Hey everyone. Wait, I, oh, are you waiting for me? Yeah. Oh, no, oh, you're you're for me. Sorry. <laughs> 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 and uh, we're just coming to you guys with a, a list of some senior privileges that we wanted you guys to look at um, for the high school. So, um, you guys can look at your paper for the, the list of senior privileges it starts with um the idea of like an open campus that would allow seniors to leave during like non-instructional times um seniors would have the options to leave during their like study centers lunch nat if they were not teacher requested which um if you had a quiz or a test to make up for a teacher they can request you to come back for at well so, if you're in like national honor society or like Groups and clubs. ATs, yeah, when the clubs and stuff happen. Um, there'd be a sign out sheet at the front desk. So you can come to the front desk and sign yourself out, say that you're leaving in the time, and that way, after you leave, the school isn't liable for you being at the school. Uh, only this main front entrance would be used. That way, all the traffic can come out and use the sign out that would be at the main lobby as well. Um, if you're driving, you have to drive along, obviously. You don't have to drive in like a car with the kids everywhere. Um, and administration has the right if uh, you do come to school and the uh, weather conditions aren't really safe for driving midday, they can shut it down, come in the intercom, talk to the full hall of people and say, have uh, something. In order to maintain these privileges or like get these privileges to start, in order to drive, we're going to give a permission slip to parents. So that will be like said and done from the start. And parents will have to keep on saying, yes, they can drive, yes, they can drive. Uh, participate in senior meetings with the school counselor by September 30th. So every senior will go to their school counselor and participate in a meeting. Return all medical forms to the school nurse by September 30th. We all got the sheets at the beginning of the year. So those should have been or should be altered by September 30th and complete 20 hours of community service by February 4th. So that should be done before that time period. Um, and then one thing we want to highlight was that each senior is responsible for themselves. So if one student goes and doesn't sign out or they just misuse the senior privileges that their privileges will be taken away for themselves and other kids won't get penalized for that. 
Um, we said for offenses, like the first offense would be your permanent use taken away for two weeks minimum. Like if it was a higher offense, like destroying property during school hours and you left, like um, people could like choose to have it be longer than two weeks. Uh, second offense, we said taken away for a month minimum, and then the offense revoked for the entire year. Um, and we said some um, behaviors include um, not signing in or out, being tardy to your next period. Like if you left and then you had like an English class, if you're late to that class, driving in an unsafe manner, if someone around town sees you driving really fast and they contact the school or another school teacher sees you out there driving not safely, then that could be in trouble. Making a purchase for ninth and 11th graders. So if a ninth grader said, can you go get me McDonald's for lunch and you go and get it to them and interrupt them, if you're going, you're going to get stuck for yourself. Um, transporting students in a vehicle during the day. So like Kyle said, only trans riding in your vehicle and driving your vehicle. Behaving in a manner that, manner that reflects poorly on school, like write-ups or if teachers just think you're not being a decent human being and then breaking any school rule. Um, also, to maintain these privileges, we need a 2.5 grade average in any class, uh, resulting in loss of privileges. Uh, loss is the same for loss of misbehavior. At the end of quarter one, students with any grade below a 2.5 will lose privileges for two weeks. End of semester two, students will, with any grade below 2.5, lose privileges for that month. In end of quarter three, students with any grade below a 2.5 will lose privileges for the remainder of the school year. Basically, the paper that you have in front of you is like a contract. This is what we go out to all the seniors, mm -hmm. get it signed by your parent. Um, you, you sign it, and you're agreeing to the fact that, again, the four of us are coming up here for our class to fight for the rights. But after this, if we get them for them, they're on their own, and they have to continue to earn them throughout the school year. I really appreciate that you covered so many bases that all the concerns that the community or parents or even students would have, you kind of hit all of those. Like what happens if their grades are slipping? Like what happens if they're abusing their privilege? And 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 that it's an incentive that every every student starts off with a privilege and then may lose it. So I completely agree. It's so well thought out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can I ask a clarifying question? So the the grade piece, so at the end of quarter one, if they have any grade that's below a 2.5, do they have two weeks to get that grade up or it's that they lose it for two weeks and then they would get it back and then you'd reassess at the end of the next learning period? I think you need to get it up. Yeah. You have to, you have, to have a, a passing grade in order to get your privileges back. Okay. Yeah. So they would lose it for a minimum of two weeks and they'd have to get their grade back up. So can I assume that your intent would be if it took them three weeks or four weeks to get their grade up and get their privileges back at that time? Yes. Okay. I agree with you, Polly. This is very well thought out. Are you going to pitch it to the students or who's, who's going to like go over this? We're going to have a, we're going to have a meeting yeah. once we get this finalized, if we didn't know if there would be any week and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then we'll have a, an assembly and, and basically do the same thing that we're doing. Perfect. Because I loved your examples, like you can't break that McDonald's, <laughs> you can't put somebody in your car, and like all those things I think the students would respond to better than if once. maybe they're one thing I think has <laughs> faulted in the past is that um, it hasn't gotten out to the teachers as well. Like teachers, it's kind of their job as well and their role in this giving us this privilege is to keep an eye on all the seniors right. and make sure that they're saying, you know what, that's not be handed out. You're not supposed to go and get stuff like your so and so. Perfect. Oh, but we did say, like, if there was four people that were all going to go get some way, you could send one person, and if they're all seniors, they can bring it back for, like, the yeah. seniors. That makes sense. Let's try. Yeah. yeah. Let's try. Let's room for access now. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? Or... Oh, you're going to present to students. Are you presenting to the staff as well?
Well, it's a student staff. Because they'll probably be it's a senior meeting. Yeah. 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 So maybe that's something you could you can work with Mr. Webb about is to figure out this file. Okay. I think you said it's important for the teachers to understand this too. Right. So maybe you could work collaboratively and figure out how to make sure everybody explicitly understands it. And so um, are we acting on it under um, Mass Agenda or are we acting on it now? It's up to you. Maybe you hope that we should it now. Okay. So if there's no question or comment, I would entertain a motion. I make a motion. Okay. Sarah makes a motion. <laughs> makes a motion to approve. Um, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Oh, that's right. We have to go one by one. Shaylee, did you hear the presentation? Yes, I did. Okay, so uh, I'm doing a roll for approval. Uh, what's your vote? Aye. Sorry. Seven. Okay. Aye. 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 And so next, um, are there any, what is this? Jenny Allen, hi. Thank you guys. These are pictures of the court that's been Um, I'm going to present what your overall proposal is. I don't think they have a lot of free information. But yeah, we don't. So we're brand new. So <laughs> tell, us, tell us what you're thinking. Okay. Hello, my name is Jesse Allen. And our sophomore here at Innsbruck Falls High School. The project that I'd like to talk about is the courtyard space and its changing use. The courtyard space houses a lot of potential that is currently being underutilized. Being the courtyard space more aesthetically pleasing and creating an environment to charge thinking could provide an opportunity to help students relieve stress and increase their productivity. The changes I'd like to implement are first, in the space more useful. It being outside space with multiple uses that is safe for students. Possible uses would be small classes, quiet space during academic time, study hall, lunch, and after school time. Second, using space for different learning opportunities. Great place for students that are interested in plants, like science. Other parts of the building, like Cold Hall or Fear Center, can use the space and building raised beds, giving an enriching learning experience, and harvesting food could be a fun project for students. But bringing different programs to our school, like Vermont Youth Council, Farm to School, and FFA, as well as Cold Health Care Center, are possible programs that could use this space. These supporters can also give a helping hand to make this possible and keep up with the maintenance. The longevity of this project is very important. To ensure its continued success, I will establish groups and communications with above programs and groups to create a long term maintenance for the project. Time and space to the community and outside local businesses, and not just using groups already in the school system, can help this dream become a reality. Any questions? Where did you come up with this idea, Jesse? Um, I was I used to have a short class that was um, you have to walk through the grass all the way to get there. And I walked past this space every day and I said, why aren't they doing anything with this? It has so much potential. Mm -hmm. It's just a blank space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. That's And you know what would be like? I love your your assessment, but 
I'm a gardener, so I'm like that. <laughs> but I would even think that there's probably the community that would love to contribute to some of this. Like I'm even thinking like I'm not bad, I would love to give you some of that. Or, right. And that would be even kind of neat to like incorporate the, what the community has to offer. And this is great. I mean, if this gets approved, I want to send out a Google form yeah. for potential donators or businesses that can help contribute to this. Yeah. Okay. I just want to say that this this right here is my office window, and there used to be a really pretty plant in the spot, and this makes me so excited to be like, oh, like flowers and like palm trees, and like yeah. I love it. Yeah, that's Do you envision um like students maintaining all of it? Like what about like mowing and like with Copolo's fill? Like how do you how do you see students like not just contributing but maintaining it? So this kind of ties into the timeline of the project. So the ideal timeline of this project is to start innovations this coming spring and to allow established connections to improve that curriculum. So it's not just going to be student led or just groups going in, we're all going to be part of the class. Could I mention something? Yeah. Um, so what is particularly impressive to me about this is not only Jesse's initiative and her research, but um, there are a lot of different factors. You know, this is a, a historic building. And so there are a lot of different parts to it. And so Jesse has gone and done the research. She met with our, uh, our head of facilities here on site, Doug LaCrosse. And Doug had a whole list of, you know, here are a bunch of concerns for the long term. Are we considering them? And when I met with Jesse and she made her presentation, she had addressed every one of those specifically. And so I think thinking uh, critically around anticipating obstacles and finding ways around them is, is just such a marvelous skill. So I was particularly impressed at the in person research and the, the number of modifications that you made to your original thought in order to get something that would be really sustainable for our facilities folks too. Yeah. Just to speak to that, like you talk about the plum tree. Um, oh yeah, talk <laughs> I know a lot of research on this plum tree. I have to make sure that the root system doesn't go too deep because it's very nice to concrete. So I don't want it to affect the concrete. And also I don't want to have any fruit because that could be an injury waiting to happen. And it's a lot more maintenance. So there's not going to be two of them. So we'll have any fruit. It's also a double flowering one. So it's flower in spring and fall. So you can enjoy it twice. And um, that's so funny you put all of that because I saw the one pumpkin. I'm like, don't you need two to get it? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. I was going to say nothing. <laughs> you knew that. Okay. <laughs> That's funny because I was thinking, I'm like, what a mess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's that, and there'll be no protect us. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is this is really impressive. And whether you're leaving your mark on the school as well. And and with the um with the uh the what were they the um like the pavers for the pavers? The, the, the memorial pavers mm -hmm. that people can leave their mark to. Yeah, okay. that's, okay. that's like so would be great for sponsors because yeah. if they donate a certain amount, certain amount they can put a grip in the small so I think, are you asking for, do we have two questions today? Um, kind of, I'm just okay. asking for people to start reaching out for grants and start the process of building the space. So you're asking for permission from the board to use the space and go seek some, seek some grant funding. Yes. And then after you seek the grant funding, will you come back if there's a financial request from the board? Yes, or are you, are you requesting a financial investment from the board tonight? Um, well, I have reached out to Miss Irish at Colorado to look into some grants. So, um, 
I might be able to get a decent amount, but I was wondering if you could double whatever I get for pants. That was hilarious. By double, do you mean give the same amount, like match it? Yeah, mm -hmm. match, sorry. No, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking you can't do up to, like, I'm looking at your cost estimate. And so, uh, whatever you get for grants, we would maybe double up and up to that to make sure that it happens. Are you going to fundraise for it too? Or just yes. Yes. So, uh, why don't we why don't we do this grant? Uh, or this is what I proposed. Okay, yeah. Those are grants and the fundraising first, and then see where she ends up. And then see where we're going. Yeah, and then we can we can fill in the gap. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah, exactly. And again, when I was talking about, you know, maybe the community would want to donate um, grants and donations and fundraising. Let's see how close we get, and then we'll come back and, and fill that in. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, do we need a motion to so that you can go ahead and proceed? Okay. So I'd entertain a motion um, to proceed on the. Um, I, I, I got one. I got one other. I got one other. Oh, yeah. do, do you have uh, a faculty member yeah. or somebody that's helping you oversee this project? Yeah. Um, I have some of my teachers that are very interested in helping me. Okay. So and also the like members of this like. Um, I'll probably reach out to Ms. Stevens to see if she can help oversee this project. She's also part of the FFO, so yeah. okay. I'll help with multiple All right. supporters. I would agree that you can some advisor in the process. Yeah. I think she's looked at that mobile part of the curriculum. Part of the longevity of the Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Oh, I will just say a thing. So I'll entertain a motion um, to have Jesse Allen's um, courtyard project um, approved for work. Let's make the motion. Um, Shaylee, we have a motion to approve Jesse Allen's courtyard project. Hi. Six. Hi. Seven. Hi. One. Hi. Sarah, I, and I'm Good job. Good job. Okay, and so once we have recognition of visitors, are there any other visitors that want to participate? Nobody on Zoom. Nobody on Zoom. Is there anybody here? Okay. Um, so that brings us to um, the school spotlight. Let's go to Paula first. Um, are we not able to present? Nancy? Well, it is a new school agenda. I couldn't, I couldn't access it. No, it's the trust that. Just change your share sizes and then we'll all be able to get to it. Right now. Okay. I'm try to my laptop for you. All right, try that. Okay, I got it. Does it work? Yep, got it. Good. So, part of this is going to be asking for money. And before I start that, some of you may have seen a messenger article that came out today. Yeah. And that article was going to come out Friday. So um, we did the interview last week, and she's, I said, when is this getting presented? And she, or when is this going to be uh, published? And she said, Tuesday or Friday. I'm like, well, Friday would be best. Um, so I just want to make sure I wasn't trying to do any calculated move. I, I, didn't, I don't think this would be a place where any sort of weird calculated move. I don't feel like there's any non support for Sugar House. So I thought that title and the the title has something to do with board to approve a loan. And I just didn't think that was the, the essence of the article when we were giving it. So I want to apologize for that. I should have probably used one of these words to do the interview in the first place. So um, I said I won't try any dirty politics. Um, and just would see what that would be a place for that. But anyway, we got it. All right, how do you do that? Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> so uh, all I want to do is let you know. So I, I presented a while back three phases of what's going on at Cold Hall. Uh, phase one was move the pole barn, get it to the woodlot. So I can stop it up there. So uh, we tore that down last year, got up to the woodlot. Um, all of this was done with gear funds under the idea that I was creating outside spaces for if we ever had to go go school or go remote, they allowed us to use this money to build some spaces for the outside. Um, do you run any more? Yep. So uh, obviously the construction students um, <laughs> tore that down and replaced it and go to the, last, the next one. And that is the finished project. So you can see that back room right there was the addition that is the actual outside classroom with the cubbies and um, we're running electric electricity up there this week, I believe. And so um, it's not really an outside classroom, but it's an outside classroom enough to be used for the funds that I have. Um, all right. And then part of that others was the greenhouse. Um, as you can see, we have a greenhouse. Uh, we're going to build a greenhouse. I don't have anybody right now that has <coughs> time or willingness to build a greenhouse. So if you know of anybody that's looking for a major two side job to tear down and put up a greenhouse, I would love their name. Uh, we do have some ideas of some students that would do that. Um, the construction students don't have time. Um, so we're looking for um, the greenhouse be purchased or to be constructed. Uh, Right now we're on the wait list for spring, but I'd like to have it done before that. Uh, and I've got as many feelers out for people that do kind of odd jobs and things like that, but it's not constructed yet. Um, phase two, we moved the barn. And um, so there was a red barn there. Uh, the barn's gone. Um, Scott with you won that bid and they tore that down right before school started. Um, as you can imagine, part of this phase was the fact that that was all of our storage. And so I've got some just pictures of, there's our of the Connex boxes that are out behind our building um, with all of our storage. So not pretty right now, but you no know, construction project is. Um, we also were able to purchase another garage for Baxter, which is there. That is where the pole barn was. And so that is our makeshift storage. That building will be moved ideally in the future. <coughs> Phase two continues, and this has been um, a much bigger project than I expected. Working with civil engineers, electrical engineers, structural engineers, um, going back and forth whether it's an educational building or an agricultural building. Um, we were really hoping that it was going to be able to be a bag building, but if the students are going to be in it, it has to follow other codes, which hasn't been ideal for a lot of things. We have won some battles around the fact that an energy efficient building for educational use has to be basically airtight. And so we really had to talk with engineers about we don't always want a sugar house airtight um, and up the code. So uh, the next picture is the design. Um, so our construction students work with the forestry students on design and flow. What you see on the left is going to be where the sap um, comes in. There's going to be three rooms in the back. Um, an our, our, our reverse osmosis room that will then go to the rig room, which will be in the middle, and then um, storage and processing rooms also in the back. Um, and oops, go back to it. And the front, it will be a foyer, there'll be a bathroom, we need to have a bathroom, and there'll be a foyer that is not a retail space, but more of a showcase space where students will come in first, learn about processes before they go on the tour of the center. So um, at this point, um, Seth has been working extremely hard trying to get figures, numbers, um, and at best right now, uh, he's coming up with not to exceed $350,000. And so what I'm proposing is um, a loan from the capital reserve fund to be paid back by the forestry club and talking with them, they said they can guarantee $10,000 a year. They can potentially exceed that but they didn't want to give a bigger number right now because of a variety of factors, including they don't know how much they could have a bad year and they, can't, they don't really have a way to make up means another way. Um, we have also looked at, we've worked, we had an open house last week and the Vermont, one of the, the treasurer or secretaries of the Vermont Sugar Makers, the parent of one of our forestry students, 
Um, they have been reaching out to a bunch of their, um, their connections uh, and they want to support this project. Um, benefit of that article coming out was that people's stress call today and they're helping helps. We want to be a part of this. And so we are um, hoping that through donations, through sponsors, that we'll be able to pay that loan back a lot quicker than 35 years. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating if they have good crops, they can pay that back, you know, 10 to 15, to $15,000 a year. But again, that's anticipating that all other, everything goes smoothly. So my request on this part of the project is a loan from the Capital Reserve Fund. Uh, Morgan, I would imagine, would draw up some sort of contract between the board and the forestry class to make sure that we pay back our loan. That's that part. Do you have any questions about this part? Do you have a floor plan? Yes. In the hands of the engineer, though, because I have to go back. Okay. Um, because they did not have the beams in the right spot. Okay. And so, but I can send them to you when they are active. Okay. And then it, this is oriented. So, you are. If you go back to where you took down the red barn, right? Yep. That doorway is part of the driveway. It's going to be facing the, the driveway coming in. Again, right? Okay. And so, your, your, um, Place where you're going to bring in the sap is to the left of that. Okay. Right? Okay. So you can pull in this, it'll be um, even with the driveway that is there, so you can easily back up and turn around. Okay. You got a truck? Not yet. Okay. Well, we have a one ton that we haul about 500 gallons of sap. Right. And then are you, uh, I'm assuming you're going to put all new journey equipment in here? Um, not with the money to build it. Yeah, uh, but we're working with Leader, and they want their products in there. Okay. And so right now it's going to be if if those grants and those things go according to plan, then we would have a uh, natural gas burning grid. Okay. Uh, but we're prepared to not have that and still have the oil burning. Okay. Uh, but Leader and CDL have been very generous with us with new filter presses, tanks, um, ROs, and things like that. So. Okay, and my other question is, do you ever envisioning buying SAP or no? Um, yes. Okay. Yep. <laughs> we all, we've always had some students who have that have an app and we bought them that. Okay. Nate, in the original plan, you had, uh, you talked about students coming to do tours. Yep. And that or, the original idea was coming in the front would be kind of a, Classroom meeting yep. space, is and, that then the, and then the rig room is, is large enough to host about easily 15 to 20 people far enough away from the rig to not be dangerous. Okay, how big is that opening classroom space as you walk in? I don't know off the top of my head because just five days ago they they missed a few beams because they mm -hmm. wanted to be able to raise up the top of the evaporator and they did not know that, okay. and so we had to redo some where the windows are. And, and the, the actual overall structure because of lift, okay. the ability to lift. They also had um, two garage facilities. That, you can see a garage door right there that went this way. They also had a garage door going into the rig room and they would have hit. So we had to do a few different, so they've had to redo some floor plans. Can you talk about how you came up with this design? So um, the construction class visited. Um, multiple sugar houses, uh, small and large scale, and each student designed floor plans that then were presented to the forestry class. The forestry class then said, we like this, we don't like that. We want to make sure stored, we want to make sure the flow was right. Um, and they ended up using um, two students, Kate and Yates, who was just presenting, and Quincy Deckers. Um, those were the two best floor plans that they then melded together to get kind of one floor plan that was then sent to Black River Design and they did the final, well, almost final design. I'm sorry. Um, they've been bidding out, so they've been trying to, we've been trying to get a number, um, that's the important thing. Um, and they did um, lumber alone, um, fix and stuff, we're gonna give them a, a, a good deal on lumber. I think lumber alone is between 55 and 70,000. 
and they've been they're waiting back to hear from uh, concrete uh, or the, the pouring. Um, and again, that's another thing that to go back because they had for the whole building had spot and I'm talking about that. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what um, so for example, the slab was five inches with 16 inch on center rebar. And they thought they could get away with four inches and at least all the rooms but the rig room and maybe the set of the, the bulk paint room. So they're hoping that they can, you know, the engineers come back and say anything. Four inches is not so much rebar work in all the other rooms, which would be, which would be the cost. Um, Seth will be working with all subcontractors. Ideally, those subcontractors are going to be willing to work with our students and helping them so when it comes to plumbing and to electrical. Um, same thing we did for the stack chat. All those subcontractors were willing to have our students on hand to be part of that learning experience. So um, the amount of buzz around Full Hollow um, for this project for forestry and really construction um, is really, really raring to go. Um, they're starting to learn that the process is being permitting. So, so we've been doing the town permits, but that has to go before the DRB. Now, Jesse said today in an email. Um, so, um, so that's because it's. I don't exactly remember why it has to. But so I'm looking at this that I'm checking out right now. Is actually agribusiness <clears throat> and manufacturing is not permitted in that at all. Right. But you are an educational facility, so that's what's making it permitted slash conditional use. So I think maybe that's why, because if it was any of the other two. Before. When do you get the floor plans? One um, of those, when are you suspecting that they will come in to you? I can get the, I mean, we have the, the inaccurate ones. I would like to run over if you want to. When are you getting the accurate ones? Um, we had a meeting today with Black Lives Matter and she said this week they'd be done. So that's where I'm kind of sitting because, like, even when I saw them in the newspaper, I was like, this is kind of the first time we've seen numbers. Right. And I feel like we've kind of asked for those like specifics. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so I do not feel comfortable. And you're welcome to, as a board, to, you know, over me. That's what a board does. <laughs> but I don't feel comfortable giving the go ahead on numbers. I haven't asked you to see, like, the specifics. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's me. So, yeah. um, Right, like I said, I don't know if we'll have a number until we can go to fish, so I'm not sure. But as far as you like should versus Black River, right, they should itemize that what those things are going to So we don't, we don't, well, well, we don't hire them to do that. Seth is doing all that. Okay, he should be able to hire. And even as a project, like even okay. if I was like a private person and I'm building okay. a house, he should be able to tell me what it's going to cost. And then we can talk. Um, not to say, I mean, first of all, I just would like to say, do I think this is outstanding to speak? Yes. Do I think this is outstanding to the community? Absolutely. Do I support the project? Yes. Mm -hmm. However, I need to know if this is a cost-benefit analysis, kind of, where do we need to alter anything based on the cost that we're getting? Like, I, I just want to be an informed <coughs> I want to, I want to make that. I don't disagree with you, and I think <coughs> it's great that six sticks and stuff, for an example, giving right. you a fantastic price. Mm -hmm. I just went through this whole thing. We're building a 30 by 32 edition on nine <coughs> sticks and stuff offered to knock 20% off because it's so much. But Lowe's regular price far beats sticks and stuff 30% off. So I just questioned and it. At the same time, I agree with supporting local, mm -hmm. um, absolutely, but without any kind of cost comparison. You know what I mean? Is it sure. is it truly cost effective? I agree, I also support the whole thing, sure. but it's really difficult without a floor plan and without right. some so kind of have, estimate. I can have the construction class come in next time? And do that presentation. If they bring numbers, that'd be special. Okay. Because they're just going to come in and talk about why you should have it. I already know. Okay. Um, but I I want to see like what it's going to cost to build this thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Public access access or no public access? Sure, and when we're there, yes. Okay. 
I think an av at least an yeah. estimate. It doesn't, I mean, yeah. Right. I mean, we know prices fluctuate. They do, um, and they will. Right. Yeah, they, like I said, they've been working on it, so I mean, it's been five days. So. I mean, the town building a sand and salt shed, we went through iterations and iterations, and it's like, okay, can we shrink the footprint by this percentage in order to still keep it structurally sound and save this much money? Like, we have to be, I have to be able to kind of see if What's on the table? Yeah. Sure. Is the board comfortable with the concept of loaning money from the capital reserve fund how to much this is project? In there? Can you remind me how much is Half in there? Half a million is in there at the moment. We're spending a lot of it this year. And um, as we've done in past years, hopefully we'll be able to keep all those projects in the general fund but at the end of the year if we're going to be in a deficit. The projects where you've given approval to spend capital reserve funds will push back in. Okay. And we won't have a handle on that until we um, get an idea of tuition kids, maybe two high schools. I mean, I definitely have voiced every time this comes up, it's like, how much is that capital reserve fund? I get a little, I get a little protective of it just because I know that all the projects that we have happened in the morning. So that's why I think I need to be more into yeah. I just want to know if I should start researching what this loan agreement might look like yet. And if you guys say it's a lousy idea, I won't spend my time on that. If you I mean, start researching. So so I'm a little I'm I'm okay with it. I guess I'm a little queasy about it as well. Uh, but I'm okay with it conceptually anyway. Um, but the other thing. What are we going? What are we doing with the rest of Colorado? Well, so, um, so yep. Yeah, so we can go on. So next is that's phase three. So we have completed all the ADA compliance stuff, parking spots, door handles, elevators, and then one part of the rest of phase three is um, talking with Vern. Um, there's three different parts of this. Um, the first part, uh, an immediate part that again I don't I present is on the top left. That is a about a 30 by 100 strip of land that the neighbor has offered to sell us. Um, I think the comes down to would be parking. They want about $15,000 for that strip of land, that's what they're asking. Uh, it would be about $1,000 for a sibling or an engineer to come in and um, put the pins in and do all the assessments. And then it would be about thirty-five dollars to $50,000 Make their parking lot. So you're talking fifty thousand dollars for ten parking spots. Uh, I have no problem with people not parking at Hollow, but as a community, there is a lot of parking at Cobalo on the street. And so uh, I'm not sure fifty thousand dollars is a great investment for ten parking spots. Do we know it's only ten parking spots, or are you estimating? Estimating at, at an angle, um, and that's based on the parking spots in the country. When you say parking on the street, do you mean staff are parking on the street? No. And so then if you're forward thinking around the sugar house, would we need parking? Well, there'd be a, there, we would need parking for that. Yeah. Um, so. so that's one part of the future of Colorado. Uh, that is not the exact building that we're looking for, but we do need some additional space. And Vern and I have talked about a few things, but one would be a steel building that if the construction class eventually moves out to, it would be adjacent to where the full barn was adjacent to the um, sugar house. Um, if the construction class can move there, then that would create enough space to, to make to meet the needs of auto. And we the rest of that, like Vern has said before, the bones of the building are solid. Right? Yeah, everything's there. Um, we've got new boilers. Um, the air handlers are, are next in line. And, um, Sorry. Vern and I are thinking that it can be, instead of doing one large project that the, uh, the price tag that we last saw, um, again, breaking that into phases, turning the, if we did the construction space, and then we did the auto and the construction uh, retrofit, 
and then did room by room. So I don't know if, if you want to speak any more of that, of, of your kind of vision of that, but I think it might be cheaper to do room yeah. by room. And is it a great looking building? No, but you know, we're spending a lot of, I mean, we don't want to spend a lot of money on, you know, making a built, you know, it's really what goes on inside the building. And, and if we can make sure that's up to date and every, every class has what they need, uh, like I said, really it just comes down to space and if you have construction, there'd be enough space. So, uh, what do you envision for a size of a building? Steel building. Steel building? Um, I think it's, so. I think we did. I think it was forty by sixty was one that we priced out. And if it was just steel again, we just did just the building. And again, I'm not in the construction class. I do a lot. So after they do a build a sugar house for two, for however many two years, then they can. But once that was constructed, they can they can do the insides. They can build their classrooms, they can train the walls, and they can train that the way they want to. Again, if you didn't want to use construction classes, then I would say the labor is going to be, I believe it's about 50 50, I think, between uh, in, uh, materials and labor costs. That's what that is. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still looking at using the construction class to do most of the work. So that would be further down the road. At this, for the next few years, it's just as Vern mentioned, but uh, uh, air handlers are the digital control and then air handlers. Yeah, but I, the nice thing about this is if, we, if this is the future, I think coming in from the street, leaving off the municipals for the space because you don't have any municipals back in that thin building as of right now. So, right. It would just make sense to get in the ground and the sugar <coughs> right. Sort of thing. Right. And that is part of the, the, civil, so the civil engineer. That's what, so if you back up to the sugar in project, the site work um, is going to contain any future bills. So stormwater runoff, I mean, um, any, any power, stuff like that. The sewer is going to be, um, so, so we're still waiting on the civil engineer to get back to the on, on those things because we haven't done the permanent for those things. Mm -hmm. Or the permanent's in, but it's not. The civil engineer hasn't done it all. It's drawn in the back of what has to do with stormwater runoff and sewer and tying into the village water. Um, but there would be you know, future stuff. So that would all be put into the first sugar project. So when he does the permitting, it's, you're going to permit, he's going to put in for permits on both those. No, that, no. Just, we're going to just have available times for sewer, water, and electricity. But you're going to do the water and run off? That will be part of the, being eligible for a future bill. So the wastewater, we, it's all going to be done now for both these buildings. I, I don't dare say yes to that because I don't know. Okay. And like I said, I'm outside my realm when it comes to being a contractor. So, but we're not, like I said, because I want to use construction, the construction class to do this work, we're having to really put it in phases because, like I said, in the meantime, like they're they're like we've got um four doors that sort of put up the construction class in the meantime for the next door, but they haven't taken on any new projects because they are. But if you wanted to go a different route and not have the construction class do this work, that I can definitely, I mean, I don't know if that's hiring Black River to do some more design work or not. But. I mean, I feel like, I feel like as far as like, if we're saying that this is you know, education opportunity and community opportunity, I feel like it, who would want to at least participate in the building. Right, yeah. Yeah. Instead of hiring it out, this is the. Well, yeah, I just know that. Right. Yeah. And, I just, and I just know how much, like I said, when they did the snack check, how much pride there was in that yeah, work exactly. and, seeing, and seeing their work go from, you know, design stage yeah. to completion. And even just going with the permitting process. Like, for instance, the fact that you're going to have to get allocations for the wastewater for those from the, from the village, and they might not have. <laughs> so, like, even navigating all of those things, I think, is a, a learning experience. Kind of sure. Yeah. 
Oh, and I found out about the parking. We just would have to do a boundary line adjustment. Right. Yeah. And I think that would cost about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. And again, that's that's definitely the fiscally conservative. I don't spend money, so I don't know if that one of those cost benefits. So I don't know. Ten parking spots, please. Thank you. To check with your lawyer, and uh, even if we call it a boundary line adjustment, it still needs voter approval if yeah, it's costing you money. So that would be in November or March meeting, I would think. So one, I, I know, I know you're talking about being fiscally conservative, and one wonder is about the good neighbor part of this, because we've had complaints in the past about all of the cars that are parked along. Um, that street. Right. So I, I don't know that we've had any recently, but when I do go visit, there are it's a fair number of cars. Yeah, they've done a good job of not doing parking in the winter for snow because of snow plows. But mm -hmm. um, you know, I've talked to Gary Denton, who's thought about maybe doing a two-hour parking limit there. Um, I guess they have that around the park, and I don't think it's uh, it's worried about the enforcement of that. We don't want to do a no parking during eight to five because there are times where uh, in those weddings and churches uh, right there. Um, this year hasn't been as big of a deal. There's only there's not as many cars as there have been in the past. I think in the past there was the last couple of years there's remote schooling and things like that. Um, I think parks maybe weren't going to be school and there was many school dollars so there's parks there. So it's definitely um, in my mind, I think that we should move these two projects together. Uh, you know, so and again, I don't, maybe this isn't the way to go, but I would, I would, I would like to see the costs for your steel outside building, along with the costs for the sugar house. See where we are there, and then make a decision on how to get your funding. Okay. You know, I think that it would might be better to actually get a bond. You know, rather than trying to trying to get this out of capital reserve, it might be better to ask the voters to to approve the the, the project as a whole. That's, that's just, I mean, that's just, I mean, no, 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 when no. is our, when is our bond up? Is it this year or next year? That I think we are not budgeting for it next year. Yeah. I need to confirm that though. Would that, there be any, just worry about like paying back. It's important we pay back some of it and then the portrait book count will be paying back. Yeah. So, some of it. so I think that maybe that's, Step two is yeah. is the first. I think we've got to figure out the cost of doing this together, and then we can figure out how to how, how to cycle the revenue. Yeah, because I do like the concept of the of the of the, the forestry service for uh, the forestry class paying yeah. or paying some of that back, and I think the community probably does as well. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's <laughs> that's the that's, that's, that's the concept that they yeah. they've always used their profits to fund their operations. Yeah, I think, but they also don't maybe need to use all of their profits, right? You know, right. so I think that well, having some community support for that as well is kind of that way to go. That's just kind of what it. That's just. Wondering if you want to help on costs. Is that all right? Yeah, I can. I mean, like I said, I I don't want to infrastructure get it all done in one shot yeah just mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, then, it, and then yeah we got the building up and then when it's what's the construction crew gets done working on the sugar house they get to move right over otherwise we're going to be back to where we are now wondering how yeah. we're going to fund, fund it out of the capital reserve yeah. so, they uh, also have the idea of purchasing december. that land I last think. december just december, last december. Yeah. So, Purchasing that land, I think you should consider at the same time because you're talking to do all the groundwork and the yep. permitting, all of your wastewater is going to be connected to any impervious. So, why not do it in one? Right. Yeah. One fell swoop because then you're going to have to go back out and look at wastewater again because you're going to add more impervious. Yeah. One thing you want to 
but pretty extensive given that his property should have been announced. So I'm pretty comfortable about that. Mm -hmm. At least we know what we have. We know know where the line is. We know the line. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, if you could go in the, just because you're going to mess once instead of twice. Yeah. 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 I think it makes sense. Oh, yeah, I'm going to burn on the two for a few times. Okay. Hoping it's possible for me. I mean, the hard part is, like I said, our, con our construction program is going to be in there for a few hours a day. And it's just different. Mm -hmm. You see, with any of these projects, people just want to hold on it. You know, because crews could probably come and done that in a week and a half. Is there some benefit to having Black River keep a more active role in this if we're going to go out to them? Uh, it likely would. And you think the engineering aspect of it, really? And then maybe the estimating. Oh, um, right. So we've, 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 we've tried to, you know, we've tried to keep them limited. So we've been trying to do all the work with the engineers and stuff like that. It's definitely time consuming. And it would be a lot of it would be a lot easier on my and the advantage of our relationship with them is that we can have a frank discussion with them and say, okay, what's the yeah. what's the most that our the kids in our program can do, and we are still able to pull off a successful bond vote. And they always, and well, my experience with option A and option B, and they always want to know what the Like you said, though, I mean, this could stretch out if you're dealing with a couple hours a day. Would it benefit you to have somebody throw up that steel building and you guys do this? Well, well, well the steel building would be fine, but it's there. Like, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, this, this, could, this could drag on yeah. for years. I mean, I remember when BF8 did their first house, I think it took them five years to finish it. Yeah. Yeah. Not five years. Yeah. That's what I was thinking was coming in and doing that big finishing work or something. No, not going to be. I, I, I agree with you 100% more to get the kids involved in it. But, um, it was fine. It was, it was fine. Mm -hmm. it was taking, well, I mean, it was taking a long time with the other ones. Getting drawings, getting permits, getting civil engineers, getting people to come and put in there. You can require them to do a certain amount of time, like a couple hours a day, right? But that's not to say that they wouldn't want to get together on a Saturday and pull some extra time if somebody's willing to be there with them and help instruct them, right? Because just because you're limited during the week doesn't mean it's not something that they're taking pride in and want to do. So. I would want to just throw the caution up about you want you to have plans with you. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So that would yeah, be that's a good piece. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not like I mean, it's not like the old days where I think Charlie Nagel took out a personal loan, buy a tractor, and then paid it back to Sherman Tractor. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those days are over. So, does the board feel comfortable in waiting for those numbers, or did you want to do some different action on that? I really think we need the floor plan and at least an, an estimate. I mean, they should know how many boards they need, what's required to build that, you know, and you could get an estimate from sticks and stuff for that or from Lowe's or whatever. So um, it sounds like that. Okay. So you're doing an estimate, you turn it out to them, basically. Right, yeah. So yes, about that or no, about I think we just need. I don't think we're there yet. What? I don't think we're there yet. Okay. Well, so I'm going to try to get at least the sugar house estimate first. Still, the building is that's the site work as well. The concrete as well. So I kind of been in the background for five years. So right. Well, if we're doing a new, if we're doing a steel building, that right. would be. Your so, engineer. Engineer. yeah, okay. And we've tried to, we, we've already, I think, with Chuck's last time, we've done a lot of the cost cutting pieces, I think. So, things like they went into 40 class long as a gradient piece 
and instead of construction costs. So, you know, molding and roof is going to be cheaper, but and then I can have, I probably can have the class and then have a few square of that give and take it. Um, it's, it's just, but, okay. Uh, but yeah, it's. So, Nate, at least again in my mind, I, I would like the cost estimates in both buildings. Okay. And then let's, you know, the other thing is we got to make sure we're going to maybe get permits for these two. Yeah, that, that's Yeah, we got to check that out because we kind of look at it. Got about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of money. It yeah, needs yeah. more than 15 minutes. So, Rachel, so sorry. No money. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can be pretty quick. Do you want to present my money? Um, so I'm going to talk about our school um, kind of restructuring our advisory system um, to make it like what we're doing this year to make it more purposeful, um, more meaningful, and to attach more. Um, just a touch more value to it for both our school and our community. So, um, so I've also put in some pictures and I can explain them as we go. So, um, our goal is to create more meaning and intention with advisory to ensure all students have a strong adult connection in school. Um, I, mean, I would add to that, especially based on the discussion we had today, is um, make sure everybody feels like they can from it because. Um, so um, the, the picture you see on this, um, and you'll see a couple of iterations of this, the start of the year, we always do some community building. So one of our TAs did this like hexagon activity and they pieced it together with the quilt so it like, represents kids and their interests and um, who they are. So, um, so we are structured. Um, Currently, so we used to have a TA time every day and we would do some really intentional stuff at the start of the school year and then some activities throughout the school year, but it would kind of peter off and different groups would have really different experiences. So this year we decided we want to be really intentional. Um, we changed our schedule a little bit to really increase our instructional time, which took away some of this advisory time. So um, we said for what we have, we want to make sure we're using it in a, a really effective way. Uh, to make it really meaningful for kids and give them some supports and structure. So it meets every Monday and Friday for a 45 minute block. Um, it's mixed six through eighth grade. So if you start with a teacher in sixth grade, they remain your advisor through seventh and eighth grade. Um, this has been a really powerful thing for several years or many years, as long as I've been there in middle school, um, because they build a really, really strong connection with an adult learning in the first three years. And that person really knows that. Um, incredibly well. In fact, our end of the year speeches that each TA gives about each student are pretty, like, they they just have a relationship that you can't get after one year. Um, so we find a lot of value in that. Um, and then we also have each TA select an eighth grade TA council member. Um, usually they have to, like, give a speech. There's a voting process. They have to commit to follow some expectations. They're going to take on some leadership in our school. And they're going to be helping a lot more than ever this year to plan TA and school activities. Um, those kids who were selected this past week and are continuing this today um, will be with their teachers. So this year, what we're doing that's kind of new is um, um, is we're picking some quarterly themes. So um, each quarter of the year. The TA time is focusing around one of these ideas every time they meet. Um, we're starting off with the idea of teamwork because we thought that's like a good way to build community and build connection. Um, we also always start off with like sixth graders who don't really know what middle school is all about, and eighth graders who have done it for a few years. So there's some opportunities for like, hey, like here's a conversation about when you're starting to get overwhelmed in classes and it's, you don't fall behind and here's how I standardize and here's how I can help you as an older student. So um, what we did as part of our in-service was we created a bank of resources for the whole year. So we have hundreds of, actually more than we need, actually we have hundreds of um, 
like community building discussion topics, we have activities, we have team builders, we have lessons um, based on each of these themes. So we're starting with teamwork. In the second quarter, we're shifting to kindness because quarter two moves us through the holiday season. Um, the thinking is that uh, our school always does some things to try, to, like we made uh, cards and brought them over to Bradley for the residents um, or on the holidays and doing some things just to like be kind to ourselves and each other. Um, seems like the right system for it. Um, quarter three, we're going to focus on service. That could be service to the community, the class, or the school. So each TA is going to be picking something to either make their classroom, their school community, or the, the school, the town better. They're going to come up with a project. They're going to bring it to fruition. Um, I have to thank Bethel Dunn's beautiful sign that she shared the uh, one of the meetings last year as inspiration because we talked about that in um, our in-service and um, the teachers love the idea of doing something that makes your school community a better place for everybody. So, um, Okay. <laughs> okay. And then quarter four is going to be selected. Um, each TA council member, um, they're going to be learning how to do um, student-led restorative circles throughout this year, and they're going to lead their group by the time we get to quarter four, which starts in April. Um, they're going to lead their home road through a circle to select the theme that each that, that each TA wants to do. So they might want to go back and do another service project because they enjoyed it, or they might pick a totally different theme. Um, and then the, the eighth grade leader in that group, along with their teacher, will help to plan and facilitate how that will look. So we are spending the first you know, three quarters of the year building those skills, and then the students will be able to take over um, and lead their tours. Um, so I put some examples, I just kind of went through these, what each uh, theme are, is going to look like, but we have, um, like I said, we have a bank of resources that we've compiled. So, um, and I'll share some pictures next, but uh, right now we're just doing the community building piece. So uh, kids are getting to know each other. We're doing some like challenges and team builders um, and some goal setting and um, getting like their personalized learning plans ready to roll. How are they going to reflect on their growth over time, things like that. So that's all going to be part of our teamwork theme. Um, kindness, it might be things like running a food drive. Um, they're going to be having a lot of facilitated discussions on like peer conflict. How do I interact with people? By that point in the year, we're at like conflicts have arisen. It's in middle school, everybody's um, analysis. So it's, there's a lot of that. So uh, we help, we're trying to, we have some specific lessons from a program we're using this year called Second Step, where um, they're going to go through some activities and like. Uh, um, lead in every school, every classroom in school, we have some similar discussions and conversations. Um, and some intentional instructional ability for us as well. Um, like I said, service will be selected by each TA. Um, and I'm really excited for quarter four because I don't know yet exactly what each TA is going to pick, but um, it's going to be really cool to see this in the years with that on. We just started. Um, so I have a couple just pictures of how it's looked so far. It's pretty early in the school year, so I don't have a ton yet. Um, but you can see some of these hexagon activities um, we've started off with. This particular TA, um, each side is something about them, and then the TA can make connections. So anywhere they connect, those people had something in common. And so then they put it up on the wall. So that was a like, like, there's one like in the middle, like they both liked Legos. And so those went together. And then another one was like horseback riding. And those went together. So it's like not only learning about myself, but how I kind of feel like what it to me. Um, this one is kind of hard to see in the middle, but they were doing, um, they're all, the whole group was standing in a big circle and they have a beach ball. And all over the beach ball, there's all kinds of different questions written. So what you catch it and whatever your thumb is touching is the question you answer. And it's a way to just get to know kids and they like, a ball, so that is also helpful. Um, just a couple of students here also making their hexagons. Um, there are a couple. Um, so this one was one of my favorites I've seen so far this year. It's called the group draw. So there's 12 people here, and they all are holding a piece of string tied to a marker, and um, it's a kitty. So, <laughs> so 
Uh, but the goal is for everyone to work together to create an image. And uh, yeah, some, some of them look just not exactly like we They had so much fun. It's like proudly hung on the wall of the classroom every, every time you go in there, like, look, you want your art. So um, that was a really cool one. And then you see a couple of kids kind of collected in groups. This is called a, a blanket flip challenge. So they're standing on a blanket or a rug. And without touching it or removing anybody from it, they have to flip it over with their feet. Um, and that was really cool to see uh, how a couple different groups problem solved through that. And then the bottom picture also is really small, but this was a group writing their own classroom expectation. And so the teacher was projecting it, but the kids were um, filling in how they would be treating one another um, this year. And so just a variety of ways they're um, showing teamwork and connection throughout the school. So that's how we've started. And Maybe someday I'll bring Um, so the big surprise in this big group in the corner, uh, did flip the rug in a minute and 29 seconds. This group, uh, five minutes in, uh, decided that they would call it, so they got a corner. It's hard to see, but uh, it's a really, really hard to do. I didn't say it's possible. It is possible, um, and I was surprised that the huge group was able to do it. They did. Um, I when I, we were talking, I kept thinking about like how much work is a graph and it's supposed to do that thing, right? Like the teamwork and all those pieces. That really yeah, we actually use the portrait of a, I guess, portrait of a learner now as a guideline for like some of the themes to make sure that we're matching the skills that they're going to do later. Um, but also, we want to let the fourth quarter kind of organic. I love the student agency that you've added into this, Rachel. And the, yeah. and the modifications seem, seem really thoughtful and strategic, even though it's less time. It seems very. Yeah, it's less time, but more intentional. Yeah. So we're already seeing a lot more value out of it um, because it's not just like, a, oh, I'm going to go hang out with my friend in the summer. Like, really get to know your kids. And everybody, like, everybody has the same thing. So everyone has a whole bunch of like, if I don't know what to do today, I can open up this document, click on something. Um, and there's like, we really made hundreds. Well, it's a cool resource. Okay. Um, next, we have Morgan. Uh, your financial update uh, through August went out to you by email. I think I figured out a way that they're going to just come automatically directly to your accounts at the beginning of the month. That should start in early October with your September reports. Um, no real concerns yet because um, we don't um, have tuition bills in yet uh, or tuition bills going out yet. And we, um, I think we only had the first not necessarily complete big payroll <coughs> in August. So once we get to to the point where you're seeing September numbers, we will have a stronger handle on what payroll's likely to be. I don't think that's an issue, but is it still in September? It is earlier today. Maybe for a I need to check. Did I get it? I will confirm that or send it out. Yeah. Okay. We'll get out to you. Um, it's late. Oh, right there. Oh, it's under the financial update. Is it this? Oh, okay. so in the, his actual board report, and it's linked in A. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there'll be hyperlinks now for everything. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I had to scroll to your report, and then it's the first. Okay. First bullet. Okay. Thank you. I have something to do for the rest of the evening after the meeting is over. Um, I've got a couple of motions that um, I need from you. The uh, annual meetings for VISIT, which is your property insurance cooperative, and VHI, which is the statewide health insurance cooperative for schools, um, will be held in Lake Maury on Friday, October 21st, in conjunction with the Superintendent and the School Board Association in their meetings. Um, Holly, you've gone to that meeting in the past, I believe. Last week, the Association. 
Um, Lynn has gone in the, the past. past. It's our conference, so yeah. it'll be back to back with uh, that one half hour block. One is the I, one is this yeah. action. Um, there is nothing exciting happening at either meeting. Um, two board seats elected at Visbet, um, both incumbents running unopposed. Um, and because of changes a few years ago with the statewide health bargaining, there's actually no action items on the VHI agenda um, because those board members are elected separately. Um, you have the option of either giving the respective boards your proxy, or you can give your proxy to somebody who will physically be there. Um, and in the end, um, I think this SU board as well have given Mary Niles their proxy. So it would be appropriate to give it to Polly if she's gonna be there or Lynn um, or Mary Niles, even though she's not on your board. And so the motion should read to appoint Polly Rico as authorized representative to appear and vote on behalf of the board at any and all meetings of the members of the Vermont School Boards Insurance Trust or any adjournment thereof. What Morgan said. So Fred has made the motion. So I'll take a roll. Um, Shaylee? Aye. 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 And then a similar motion to appoint Polly Rico as authorized representative to appear and vote on behalf of the board at any and all meetings of the members of the Vermont Education Health Initiative or any adjournment thereof. I have a motion. I have made the motion. Shaley. Aye. Evan. Aye. 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 And I'm out. Um, so one other item, I don't necessarily need a motion, but need some direction from the board. Um, you're in year three of a three-year contract for plowing your Enosburg schools, and your plowing contract for the two Richford schools is up for renewal. Um, the current vendor for the two Richford schools is the town of Richford. Um, and I need guidance from you. You can certainly talk to your two Richford principals on whether you want that to be bid out again, or if you want me to approach Richford Town and see if they're willing to roll it over for the same price. How did they do? I think it's mutually beneficial to both. And I think that they're very responsive to you. Okay. Why don't you ask them for a little later? We'll do that. And that is all I have, unless you have questions. Okay. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I have one other question. What, what ever happened to the health insurance negotiations? Are they still negotiating? Are they done? They're always negotiating. They're sort of done for now. Um, I think. <laughs> Anything that you hear through your channels at the moment is sort of positioning for the next round. Okay. Um, and to the best I can recall, I think the HSA, HRA amount drifted down a little bit for licensed staff and the um, for non-licensed staff, um, sort of paraeducators, custodians, um, administrators who don't have teaching licenses, um, our premiums are drifting up a little bit again until we hit that 2%. Ben's looking for the premium care board, just to prove increases. They would not improve increases for Beehive yet. Beehive will be going with their um, rates okay. probably in about another month they'll present. Okay. Um, at my last meeting, they wouldn't put a number on where they think it's going to go, okay. um, but they did point to the significant increase that the hospitals are asking for, saying that that's kind of what's likely to come. Okay, thanks, Morgan. How about you, Morgan? 
Okay, then it has the slideshow. So the personnel section of the slideshow is um, mostly informational. So the people that are in the hiring section are either support staff or they're fully grant funded positions. So that will go to the SD board next week. So that's all informational. Not going to leave your names unless you have want to. So um, you can see the resignations that are there um, and the open positions that we have left. There are two requests that I'm bringing to the board specific. One is specific on the next slide, Morgan, to um, our longtime administrative assistant at Unisburg Elementary School, Lisa Shady has uh, written a letter announcing that she will retire effective March 1st. She's asking the board to reimburse her for unused personal vacation and sick days at the time of her retirement. That is uh, the question. So as a support staff, um, what's the, what are those packages? For instance, so personal data all over. What, what is it? Maybe a year for uh, it's based on uh, how many hours you work. Oh, okay. It's generated separately. Um, I think we have some um, precedent that we could talk about it in terms of how we've done this in the past. So, Morgan, do you want to talk about, like, I, I think she gets paid out anything she hasn't used in terms of personal vacation. Correct. Correct. Okay. And what we have done around sick days is you have provided an equitable benefit mm -hmm. to what teachers get, which mm -hmm. is buying back those six days at a rate of. I think it's the what union supports them. Yeah, yeah. is what we've done. Right. Yeah, that's okay. right. Uh, it's either 25 or 35 a day. Yes. Yeah, like okay. If my memory serves. Yes. Your memory. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> So I'd recommend that you treat yeah. Lisa the same yeah. as what you just did with Jill. Oh, and it's up to a maximum. Yes, yeah, she has a she has a cap in terms of what she's able to accrue, right? Yes. Okay, that's good. Um, I'm trying to find out. Is there any more questions regarding that, or does anybody feel comfortable making a motion? Um, Sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. What was the motion? The motion was to approve the payout of the unused personal vacation and sick days. Um, we have precedent that we've done that previously. So actually, okay. approve the payout of the sick days because the I'm other sorry. three we do on them. Correct. Thank you. Okay, I'm an I. That was an eye. Oh, thank you. Um, nine. Aye. Sorry. Oh, nine and I. And I can't believe we said you to this retire. Yeah, I took it like that. It's crazy. Okay. Um, good for her though. Yes. She's right. been oh. doing really long time. Oh, right now. How many years? It's all on you. It's almost 30. Maybe she got the 30 year one. Yeah. 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 But she always talked about that she I mean, her office was where she went fourth grade mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. It's that central office before. Yeah. Um so I have yeah. another request. Um so we have a support staff member who um has been out. They started the year out because they had a medical uh, issue. It's an FMLA qualifying. Issue. The person has not worked long enough to accrue much by way of leave. So you have one support staff, member, support staff member who has made a request to be able to donate more than two days, as is outlined in the master agreement. So um, instead of having that limit of two, she wants to be able to donate more. I'm going to make a recommendation to the board that we don't approve that yet because I don't know that we have formally the request out for people to donate days to this person so it isn't needed necessarily in both schools. Yes. And do we know how many days we have? I have 20 days down. 
So I, I don't know that you're going to need that portion. My point is that I don't know that you're going to need it. So I think that the, let's hold off until we get to a place that there are not enough that you still need it, and we'll ask the board to take a look at that. How are we to ask Richard this? Because I think we did that for your facility. So you have 20 and 34? Yeah. yeah. So Jamie that's has, has three has months. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we'll, yeah, we'll hold off and see if if they go through the dental revisit. And I think that's point is a good one, expanding who we're asking rather than modifying the amount that people can donate. You know, there are people at central office also willing to donate. So we could be other schools as well. Okay. It's not it's not a no, it's we think that we're gonna hit the max anyway. So I don't think it's gonna be no. Okay. What happens if it depletes and there's other staff members that need to access? And they can donate two days for you know, for the bed. There's, oh, no, there's no bank anymore. Okay. okay, it's not just two no. and the bed. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. All right, Scott. So I'm giving the or um, an overview. We've done two. You've asked us, you, the SU board, has asked us to study as we mentioned, reasons that people need that heading issue. So this is year six of us taking a look at this data. So we do this in two ways. The first is an anon anonymous exit survey. So people are able to complete a form and put down all of their thoughts. The second is an, either an in-person by phone or by Zoom. HR exit interview where they actually have a conversation with Jane. She has some questions that she talks to you about. And so on the next slides is uh, a summary of this data. And you're going to get access to this at the end since we're doing it a little more deeply. So this just gives you a sense of the people who filled out the survey. Where were they from? I mean, so the 26 were, were licensed staff members and three were support staff. There's data regarding what best describes. I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I can give you some of the highlights. When we unpack this, there were three of the bigger reasons why people left were compensation, geographic location, um, workload, expectations, and leadership. It's four. Um, and then just talking about why they left to go to another difference, what were some of those differences? You can see compensation, where they were placed on steps, uh, credits, and you know, the work day. People talk specifically about seven and a half days where I'm heading instead of eight here. Hours, right? A day, yes. We've asked them to talk to us about what did you value most about your work? top part is, is a reflection of that. The recommendations, the second part is about how to improve the work we're doing at FNSU. So this, we, this part is flawed because we're asking how well do you feel supported, did you feel supported as a new teacher? But there's no way to quantify the people who filled this out. Was this someone who was a new teacher 30 years ago, or was this someone who's been through our current new teacher program? So we can't really quantify is it is it our program now? We're going to restructure this, is I guess the moral of the story. So that we can get a better sense of people we're hiring now, how well the support it did they feel. So generally they were put that they felt pretty, pretty well supported. So Jamie's exit interviews, she had some questions that were slightly different. So the first was, what did you like least about working in FNSU? Strengths and assets of our FNSU. And then reasons you're leaving as an issue. So again, we saw relocation, um, compensation, 
the staff equity within buildings was a little different. And I'm going to just explain what that was in terms of the comments that we saw about that. And I think this was, there was staff who maybe had not been in a leadership role within their schools that felt a little bit of inequity in terms of some of the people that were on teacher leadership teams having more opportunities and more information than they did. So what they were trying to communicate was it didn't feel like there was equity across staff members within buildings. Kind of. Yeah. That, that's how I took it. Yeah. And then how supported did you feel by colleagues, administrators, and central office? So generally that was very strong. What would have enticed you to stay? More money, full-time positions rather than being split. The collaboration time, time, and then defining who people report to. That must, I'm guess, guessing, be sure for position. Mm -hmm. right. I know that was really quick, and that's the broad brushstroke overview of the data we got out. We'll go more in depth with the rest of the meeting next week on that. Are there any questions about our surveys? I guess one of my questions is like, what strategies do you have in place to address that? So we have a we're working on a teacher recruitment with function strategic plan, and I haven't met with the principals yet to try to break down any of the. Some of them were identifiable in the comments, so we're talking with principals about anything that we can identify that's a school specific. Concern. I think we're already addressing addressing many of the things that they brought up in terms of you know compensation and focus, workload expectations, things like that. Um, but there were some there were some things that felt actionable that we just need to unpack. Jesse already presented. Yeah. So we know that we have uh, big board goals in the SU, and we're really, we created a board monitoring plan. And part of the board monitoring plan each September, I'm going to bring a standardized assessment results to each of the boards. And I'm going to break it up so that I'm reporting by district at each of the individual board levels. Um, what I want to start with is this data that I'm about to share with you is incredibly old. This was an assessment that was given to students in the spring of 2021. So it is more than a year old, almost a year and a half old at this time. So this has just been released to us recently. So this is a part of this is an issue with delayed reporting. We are hoping the assessment that students took in 2022 that we'll be able to report out on that data. Um, we're hoping by December. Of this year. So you're going to get a little snapshot of two year old data. And I want us to look at this through the lens of this is our baseline. Because this is after we've had a shutdown year. And it was at the end of the year that many of the kids were in hybrid and had really kind of atypical year. So two atypical years. So I'm going to start, <clears throat> we use our new EduPrimer data to put together all the students in the ERU USD. So this is reporting out by grade level third uh, through ninth grade. You can see the proficiency levels for <clears throat> would be exceeding, uh, the blue would be exceeding, green would be at proficiency, yellow would be approaching, and red would be below. So you can see um, these are how all of the students together, all of our third graders together and so forth, performed in the month ago. Then we took a look at this by gender to see is there a discrepancy between the performance level of our female students and our male students across those grade, grade levels in ER. So you can see when you look at, for example, third grade girls, versus third grade boys in math. in math. There's a pretty big difference in terms of performance. The boys are, are outperforming the girls pretty substantially um, there. It is, it is just interesting to see what those trend lines look like. You can, in this program, the principals will be playing with this. So the next 
leadership team meeting and publication can hover in this program. You can't on that because it's just a screenshot. You can see the actual percentages and numbers for each of those categories that we go through and take a look at that. So we really could try to see, you know, if you wanted to look at it bottom to top or top to bottom, you know, are there more kids that are, are way below or more kids that are, that are proficient? Can you do the same for ELA? Yes. Yeah. I think I can. <laughs> so another way that we looked at this data is students who are economically disadvantaged versus students, students who are, I'm sorry, on the left are students who are not economically disadvantaged. And on the right are students who are economically disadvantaged. And by definition, that is they need the income eligibility to be free lunch versus paid lunch is how they define this. You can see that the proficiency levels of the students who are not economically disadvantaged are significantly, those students are significantly outperforming students who are academically disadvantaged across the board. Now we looked at PLA, just seeing across the grade levels, what does the performance look like? This is by gender. So you can see female students in ELA versus male students in the LA. Is it what you thought? Oh, yeah. Oh, like, because it's like the research shows that females tend to be more language based. This is data about most elementary teachers are females. Okay. And a lot of what is they have. The experiment is to go home to the female teacher. So then looking at, I'm sorry, that should say ER poverty, not MP, I missed that. So looking at not economically disadvantaged versus economically disadvantaged, you can see wide achievement gaps between those two subgroups. So this, this is ELA, and I just want to talk about this for a little bit. So the bar on the left is kind of where all students are falling. When you commingle all the results together, that's where all students are falling in terms of efficiency. So the bar right next to that, those are, that represents the performance level of students who are economically disadvantaged and have no disability attached to them, right? When you take economic disadvantage and add in a disability, you can see what happens to the performance level. Drops significantly. To the right of that is students who have a disability but are not economically disadvantaged. So you see that we've got our performance difference between students who are living in poverty and an even bigger performance gap for students who are dealing with um, who have a disability. Mm -hmm. To the far right, that's the performance level of students who are not dis economically disadvantaged and who have no disability. So let's say no disability. It says no economic or right. I So let's switch to math, Morgan. So again, it's all Poverty, but no disability. Poverty and disability. Um, not poverty and disability. And then no poverty, no disability. So when we talk about achievement gaps, we can see that it's pretty striking, even if you're just looking at those two subgroups. I know I went through that pretty quickly. Are there any questions on the data piece? So my hope is in December to come back to you and give you another look at the 21-22 data. Um, but along the way, you're going to get uh, you're going to get information. We get information in October from some of the assessments that 
our students take at, that are part of our local comprehensive assessment plan. So it won't just be looking at the standardized assessments. We're going to be able to unpack it differently this year. So we're going to be doing a little deeper at each unit and be able to get some level of data um, going into it. Um, that brings us so um at our SU meeting, um I just talked to the board for a second who who wasn't there. Um the principal reports, yeah, they were exactly so at the SU meeting, um it it was kind of was reminded that um you know, we as the board members get their reports, which I always thought were attached to the agenda that's on the website, but they're it's not. So when we have told you not to share or just like informational, 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 what I'm failing to understand is that the public actually gets it. Um, and we had shifted a while ago because um, we used to have I'm coming back to the error of my ways and thinking that you should give a brief synopsis of your board reports so that, so that um, anybody who's watching will know what's going on in the school. I think what I gave them as a prompt was a highlight. Highlight, or something. exactly. Does it highlight. need to be connected to your yeah. board report? Oh, okay. okay. It's up to you. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure your highlights are probably somewhat beneficial. Yeah, yes, that would be great. So we'll start with Kelly. Okay. Yeah. Um, we've gone off to a great start, <coughs> despite the fact that we are starting with uh, not the long opposition, the people that have returned. Uh, it's a really solid group of people, and we don't have a lot of new staff, so that has really freed up. <coughs> Other staff, like our, our in house coaches and the other teachers, to really not have to focus on brand new teacher reports. We can really just jump in. A couple of highlights. I do want to acknowledge Vern. He has done moved heaven and earth to make things happen to the facility at Richmond Elementary School. Um, we're getting some painting done. We've done all kinds of other things done, I've highlighted those in, in the report before, and it's just been really energizing. You know, people have just come and said, oh, you mean the hallway's bigger. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just brighter. Uh, and so that's that's just, you know, it's really refreshing. The thing that I think I'd, I'd really like to highlight is that we took two days of our in-service, and it was a massive commitment. And I had a group of teachers that said, let's just do it. We had visited a school in the spring in Manchester, New Hampshire, and so we were in new school. And we decided to embark on this journey with this particular organization for at least the next three years, hopefully beyond that. And we had a presenter that came and presented for two solid days to our staff. So our focus this year will be on staff development. It's focused on the set of habits of highly effective people, supplies to the hubby. And um, a number of years ago, a principal in uh, North Carolina who had a failing school was instructed to turn it around. And she took the seven habits and brought them to her school and it you know, worked you know, magic. Now, nobody that visited the school in Manchester was like, you know, it wasn't like a, a, a religious experience where everybody came back and said, oh, this is the thing, you know? But um, people felt like we had enough going on and that this would really support us. It's not a program, it's really it's a framework really based on the seven habits. And the habits are really, when we talk about the portion of the learner and your habits are, it's like, you know, the work habits. Um, so that's really gonna be the focus. So that it was two solid days of really personal development. It wasn't even talking about academics, it was truly personal development. And so on one hand, people kind of, you know, there was this, you really should be working on academics, you know, set the question up. On the other hand, people came away feeling like it was some of the best personal 
development that we're building. So that will really be our uh, one of our big focuses this year is the staff really delving into this. We have a coach who will be working with us over the course of the year. And then next year we'll be rolling this out to students. The whole intent is really to build leadership capacity among the kids. Um, really get them to connect to the community, to be really invested in their own learning and uh, in their research and training. Oh, it's start good start of the year. How about you, Beth? So we've had a, a strong start, um, which was refreshing after the last two years. Mm -hmm. And I feel that we've been able to focus on some of the next steps of our continual improvement, both with our systems and structures and our professional learning. And um, so I think we're taking the next steps for NPSS, for advisory, with an advisory as well. Um, for uh, personalization. I, I really want to do a shout out to some of the SUY programs that I think are helping us all with personalization. So the STEPS program here in Innsburg and the PAP program at, at Richburg and um, also DAD's program. Um, I call it that program, the remote option. I think that we're, um, these are all affording people or students um, education that they need it. And I think they're they're very good district that have taken. Um, and they've been a great asset to this. I want to uh, talk a little bit about the sort of practices. Uh, we had some of our students who surfaced last year and we're trying to grow from success, build capacity. And so we're, we're growing those throughout the school and staff. We're doing circles once a month not only for community building, but we're trying to expand them to when there are issues as well. And I think that the middle school with Alyssa Valander leading it is, is, is leading that effort at Richburg. And Alyssa is also doing a peer mediation um, thing with our middle school. We're, it's one of the electives and we selected certain kids who were interested and working with that and they will eventually become peer mediation. But like Kelly said, they're focusing on their own um, development right now. Um, um, Jen. Everybody seems to be glad to be back. And the minute the kids walked in the door, it was just so much joy to see them. Um, so far, it's going well, and um, we're really working on our MTSS structure and ESTs. Um, we've already got them up and starting and um, really feel like we're so wrapped around the kids, each individual kid, no matter what their learning profile looks like, we understand them and know them. Um, this year, we're really focusing on belonging and building that sense of belonging in our school community, but also outside the school community, getting people back into the school. So that's been fun. And I think parents have enjoyed um, coming into school and some of the activities that we're doing. Um, and our student, Kate Bennett, um, she started a service learning project last year um, for a crosswalk across from the school and then to the story walk. And that's actually been put in place. And um, so we're very <coughs> proud of her and she's right on to her next project. And we have more kids that are coming up with plans for service learning projects and really making an impact in our community. So um, the teachers are really on board with this um, pulling together and the whole community, everybody working together. And the other thing um, this year, we really focus focusing on teacher resilience. And so um, each staff meeting, um, I'm referring to a book called Onward, um, but just building each month, um, focusing on what builds teacher resilience. And one of the biggest things we've done this month is really getting to know ourselves and knowing um, what type of person we are. We took a Myers break assessment and, um, and then we did a core value assessment. And it only took a few minutes, but then they took a, um, they all got a little box and they put in their 10 core values. And so each day for the two weeks, they're picking out a core value 
and saying to themselves, how am I going to use this for value today? Um, they have little journals and people are jotting it down and, and they've been really excited about that. They really appreciate that time focused on them and then getting into our staff meeting. So that's gone really well. And we have um, open house on Thursdays. So we're really excited for that. And Rachel, do you have any questions? Thanks. I said a lot into the school spotlight, yeah. so I won't take too much more time. Um, but I will also add that we too have a open house coming up. Um, last year, uh, I would I'll say COVID changed a lot of things in a challenging way, but it also like last year we did an ice cream social because we didn't have anyone inside of the building at that point in the year, and it was really well attended and the families loved it. So we're keeping it. Um, so uh, we're again doing an ice cream social for our open house this year, and but the difference this year is the rooms will be open for people to visit, um, but this time they'll just have ice cream. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. I love all those positives that we're walking away from COVID with. Like there are some things that were good about COVID that are going to stay. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to hear that, Rachel. Yeah. Welcome. This is your this is Thank yeah. You. This is my first in person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my assistant principal, Heather Hawkins, and I, Heather's been in the district for a while, but we're both new to our roles uh, in the, the leadership in the uh, Eastbrook Falls High School. And we're both thrilled to be in the position. We did a little bit of surveying of staff um, over the summer and, and asked, you know, what are some of the things that you need? We got some consistent themes and realized a, an important thing that we needed to do for the school was a, a tone reset. Um, COVID, I think, had been particularly hard. Um, and, and there was some staff turnover, I think is, is pretty known that the high school faced some staff turnover. So Heather and I looked at some, some of the different things that had come up and thought, all right, what are we gonna do to come on strong right out of the gate? So um, a bunch of things I'm gonna talk, my colleagues talked a little bit more about some of the specific initiatives. Since this is my first meeting, I'm just gonna highlight a few of the things that we've done to try and press reset on the school tone. We've tried to, at all of our in-services and meetings, have interactive components where the staff get to work with and interact with each other, share with each other. We're trying to, uh, we're trying to do social emotional wellness rather than talk about it or just read about it. Um, we're trying to do it in a more active way. Um, communication, um, I have a, a weekly newsletter I've been sending staff and I try to make it upbeat and with humor, but also with fact, facts and information and goals. Um, we also, um, some of the other stuff tone wise is, is I think teachers had gotten to a point during, you know, the, the rough pandemic times where they were feeling their own effic efficacy was dropping and so the idea was, all right, let's take on a couple of simple things and see if we can tackle it. So it sounds, it sounds mundane, but if you're in a school with high school kids, you know cell phones are just a complete monster. So in addition to stealing, uh, I mean, borrowing, creating, what is it? Adaptive reuse of, of Richford High School senior privileges, which our kids took and uh, did a nice job with this evening. But we also looked, um, we looked at the approach that Richford uses for cell phones and said, well, well, we can tackle this. We had parents saying this, well, why don't you just take the phones away? We thought, oh, all right, we're going to put in a four-step plan. And believe it or not, it worked almost to our surprise. But kids, teachers are talking about how kids are not on their phones all the time. And that that constant struggle, that constant distraction is just not the same distraction. And it seems that in putting, I had a hypothesis I shared with Lynn, that in that in drawing a really firm line there, you know, uh, like we had a kid today who, who went to the, the planning room because he had a phone out. And when he got there, Heather said, well, your choices are, you can give me the phone and your parents can come in and get the phone. He's like, I'm not gonna make my parents come in. Well, good, we had the phone. <laughs> and, and then we were able to move on. And that has trickled down into other things too, in terms of, I believe students are feeling a sense of security and support that, um, as I've said to the teachers a few times, uh, boundaries are a way of expressing care. 
And, and I think our kids in our high school needed to feel that kind of care, not just we care about your emotions, but we're gonna take care of you, but part of taking care of you means helping you make good decisions. And so um, I'm always at the risk of going on too long. So one, one, of the, one of the ways in which we really wanna support kids doing that this year is, is Heather has created, she was the social emotional learning coordinator and also behavior specialist. And it, she is renovating our planning room into, it's a student support center now, but an important piece of it is the skills academy. So we looked at the way it had been running. We're like, we're training kids for jail. We don't want to train kids for jail. We want to make it educational. So now when a kid goes to the planning room, there is an expectation, and we're ramping this up, that they're going to do some research, some study on what's the issue, right? So if it's a harass mm, harassment, kind of its own thing, right? <laughs> but let's say that there was some aspect of identity that a kid used a, an inappropriate word with a classmate. They're going to have to research you know, maybe the history behind it and, uh, you know, how it affects people. So there's a research component and then a presentation component. So if you go to the planning room, it's not just doing your time. The expectation is that you're going to do some learning and you're going to present out that learning. You're going to reflect on that with an adult. So our, and if a student does it, we're just going to hang in. So I think Heather's bringing some of her behavior background, which is like, we're going to hang in as long as you need, but this is going to happen. So in a variety of ways, we've been saying, we got you, and but we are going to hold you to this because we know you can do it. The last thing I'll throw out is, um, is, is you saw some student leadership here this evening. I have to say that I've, I've taught in five <coughs> four different high schools, and these are <coughs> overall the most polite Overall, I didn't say every day, every kid, right? <laughs> but overall, the most polite kids that I've worked with. It's clear to me that people in this community, parents and community members, are teaching your children to use manners, to consider others, to consider service, to consider leadership. And again, I'm not saying every single kid every day, but the fact that I came in in July 1st and I already had three different student proposals and more continue to come in. Uh, and the way the kids conduct themselves on a daily basis uh, just makes me think this makes me believe even more firmly what I believed when I had my initial visits here, which is that this school is in the center of the community. It's clear alumni and families really care about this school, but are also creating a culture that the vast majority of the kids, it's supporting the vast majority of them to be good human beings in the school. And that's not something you see in every school every day. So I'm really, uh, it makes me honored and proud to be affiliated with this, with this school and this community. Okay. Um, uh, as you know, we focus on academic, technical and employability skills. We're on our sixth reiteration of our employability skills. So this is our new employability skills poster and rubric. If you go down to the bottom, we, we, we had eight, we moved it down to six. They all align with the portrait of a graduate. So there's some alignment there. And then there's at the very bottom, there's some, we took out attitude and perseverance um, and made those kind of overall arching um, themes that you have to have in order to achieve all those other things. So you need your learning, the learning grow, set feedback, and just accordingly. So those are some principles that students have signed on if they're gonna be a student at our school. That they're going to try to do those things and doing that that will help with the teamwork the relationship building communication problem solving dependability and self-direction so um, so that's kind of the, that's where a lot of our professional learning work happened last year goes through the alignment with portrait of graduate and stuff like that that's the employability uh the technical skills are, are kind of inherent but the academic skills um are, are round one of work keys will be taking place in um in about, in about three weeks, two to three weeks. Um, we did some research on why what other schools were doing well, uh, what they did. Um, the number one, the top schools had academic teachers. So a lot of more full day schools that had academic teachers teaching the work keys curriculum, um, also highly incentivized. So um, if they five or higher for the day off um, at the end of the school year or another school did the day off before Thanksgiving break. 
Um, the second tier was program teachers that taught work students curriculum. And then the third tier were um, schools that had academic teachers, but not teaching the work piece curriculum. So there were people that did the work piece curriculum actually scored higher than the program teachers were teaching at first, just doing regular academic uh, lessons. We have um, purchased the work piece curriculum. We are, um, we are right now we're on hard copies, but we're working on getting it to be an online version. Um, and that's the, the focus of our team time this year is implementing those lessons into uh, into our teaching. So, um, so those are the, the three areas that we, we do. Uh, so we're hoping to have better results. Um, we probably will not see great results in October because that will be our juniors that we just barely got. Uh, however, after five or six months, and our seniors take work keys as um, in the spring, uh, we're hoping to see you know some great gains there. Uh, other than that, we had our first orientation in a few years. We wanted to try that because we had pre-tech. We have about 40 10th graders, um, and that's a new program for us. So we invited all, all first year students in. We had about 30, 30 parents come in. Um, we did that uh, last Wednesday night. Um, we might try to do it. Um, we might try to provide food, but we think we need to provide more food and maybe do it before, <laughs> we might do it before the first day of school next year, um, before they come in. Um, we were hoping that maybe having a, few, a week with them um, Picking them up might get more attendance, but it still wasn't overly attended. And I think that's for our student conferences, that's mandatory to have to come in. So we haven't had a relationship yet to make something that mandatory yet, but uh, they'll be back next school. And I think that's an echo of that. The kids that have come in have been great. They're energized, they're positive. It's been a real good start. Okay. And Bernie, do you have anything to add or you just support? Okay. Um, support business, SU board representative report. Okay. I always have one on the side. Okay. Let's, I can do this. Okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> what we did um oh, i'm gonna go back to you i thought i could i can't um that's oh we did do quite a bit of monetary evaluation it was let's see first we did uh, We, um, let's see here. Um, <coughs> yeah, we did, that was a pretty late meeting. Um, Michelle ran it, we ran the meeting. Um, we designated a visit, Mary as visit for the SU. Um, uh, central office location, it sounds like um, that by October. We hope. we hope that there will be staff in the new central office in Enosburg. Um, we also. That's, that's two weeks. I know. <laughs> I, I, I know. <laughs> okay. 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 Just went through and did their updates. Um, yeah, Vern did, did a, a presentation of the work that he did has done um, and talked about Richburg. Lots of work in Richburg on parking lot, um, parking, entrance. Um, yeah. <laughs> Talked about the gym exactly. The gym looks amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How's uh, how's Gabby's school? Yeah. So 
Um, Gab School is good. She's next to SU. She is bringing um, some data. She gave us some kind of broad statistics about achievement. And um, one of the feedback pieces was uh, parsing that out with more detailed data. I think it said like something like 62% uh, were near or above proficiency. And so just to see like how many are near, how many are above, how much. Yeah. But yeah, no, um, the numbers of enrollment, um, yeah, very good. Uh, same as last year or higher or better? Um, is Gab on? I think she might be on. She was trying to get on earlier. I think I, I just Oh, yeah. There you go, Gab. <laughs> Give us some enrollment yeah. numbers, Gab. Um, the general overview to answer your question is the K-6 program seems smaller. 9-12 is growing fast. So those numbers are larger. And then it's pretty, it's pretty even split with middle school, given that it changed, went from like 2 to 10 last year so it's about five this year <laughs> so I think you you're right around 20 k6 is that right i think it's 16. okay so one of the pieces that i, I don't remember who mentioned it earlier this school is made it possible for us to be able to operate these specialized programs like those numbers fluctuate based on the students in those specialized programs as well so that that's something that to just keep in mind that that's what she has today but as those numbers change mm -hmm. so we'll so we'll guess i think one of the things that's really impacting the the k-6 program numbers is that parents have to work but they're they've had to go back into the work place and so that's limited the number of parents who can be home with their kids i just wanted to say that gab i think is a, a great resource for all of us in the school but she's um a lot of the tools she uses she shares with us bring to us so that we can use them like for example um she brought courseware to all of us or an exact path which um and uh which is it's kind of a more usable Vermont uh, virtual learning. Mm -hmm. It's a virtual learning tool where kids can take online classes at school or get extra practice. And it, I think it's much more user friendly. We used it for summer school this year um, for credit recovery. So you can, there's like two or three different ways you can use it. And Gab has arranged the training. She helps us enter kids. She does. A lot of things for all the schools in addition to the remote learning. And I really appreciate it. And then, um, do you have any more questions? Nope. Okay. And then we, um, we drafted the superintendent evaluation, which tonight you'll see it's on our agenda basically to share with the folks that weren't there. Um, the other part folks who were at the SE meeting just to, to show you what we came up with and see if you had any feedback that you wanted to add contribute. So that was that meeting. It was pretty quick. It was a quick one yeah. Um okay uh next regular scheduled meeting is October 11th um which will be in Richford. Um set future agenda items is there anything that we Okay. Um, and so, um, does anybody else have anything to add before we go into executive to talk about superintendent evaluation? Oh, so I would entertain a motion. Everybody else can leave. Um, thank you all. Have a great. Day. Um, I would entertain a motion to go into executive. I. I'm going to do a meeting with Amanda when you get that. Amanda, Shane. Okay. 